Well, we come to the end of a year, and we've been talking about the birth of Christ, the significance of that birth, and I want to uh, just put things in perspective as we uh, look at God's overview, as He's given us in His Word, of uh, where we're going as we go to the kingdom. When we talked about the birth of Christ, we talked about the fact He was born to be king. He was born to rule and reign. That was part of the announcement of his birth by the angels. And yet that still hasn't occurred. But we are exactly on schedule. And just as God has unfolded it. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the overall perspective of God. As we move toward the kingdom that Christ will establish on the earth. And uh, I have a couple of maps. Put up number two, if you would. Uh, that's not it. Uh, there we are. I put that up uh, to show you Israel. That little land there, the red, you have the pin there, and then the red coloring marks out the land of Israel. And, of course, as you're familiar, that little yellow intrusion into the red, that's the West Bank. And, you know, we hear a lot in the world that a lot of the problems would be solved if Israel would just give that back to the Arabs. Um, and you realize Israel will never have uh, given back enough. I mean, look at the perspective of that on the Middle East. Look at the Arab and Muslim countries that surround it and that little swatch of land. Uh, put up number three, if you would. And this is just a bigger perspective. And if it wasn't for the red pin, you wouldn't see Israel. Um, it's a little patch of nothing, as you might look at a map. But it's the center of the world in God's purposes and plans. And you can't get away from it. So much of what goes on in the world comes back to Israel. And so many people in the world think we'd solve the world's problem if Israel would just give up something. What they would really like if Israel would just go away. Um, and that's what the devil would like. And that's what so much of his attention is focused on. So as we talk about something of the countries of the world today, keep in mind, that's Israel. China looks big, powerful. Well, so much of what you buy, made in China. But that's not the most important country in the world. The United States is not the most important country in the world. Um, none of the other nations, Russia, as big as they are, as powerful as they are, not the most important country in the world. That little pinprick on the map, that's where it all focuses. And in God's work, that's the center of the world. Um, let's go back to the book of Daniel in your Bibles, and you can drop the map there. We may come back to it. We'll see. Daniel's prophecy in the Old Testament. We're just going to overview what God has said in his overall plan for the ruling of the world and uh, see how it unfolds, climaxing with the rule and reign of Christ. We begin in Daniel chapter 2, and I've picked three main portions of Scripture because they cover the same material. Uh, we could find pieces and other portions of Scripture, but these give a, an overview. From really the same overview, each one filling in a little more detail. In Daniel chapter 2, the Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom has occurred. The northern ten tribes had been carried into captivity. Uh, roughly 150 years earlier, by the nation of Syria. Babylon rules the world at this period of time. And the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin, have been taken captive, overrun by Babylon. 
Daniel was among those deported from the land to Babylon. And they took some of the key people to train them, uh, the most intelligent and so on, uh, to be advisors to the king. Daniel, and he has three friends. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The Bible calls them Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Um, but they are, have been trained to be among the wise men of Babylon. In Daniel chapter 2, we are told that Nebuchadnezzar has a dream at night. And so he calls his wise men. And there would be numerous uh, in that uh, contingent. Uh, and he wants them to tell him what his dream is and what it means. They say, of course, tell us the dream. We're wise men. We'll tell you what it means. Nebuchadnezzar is a very brilliant ruler. And he says, no. If God can reveal to you what my dream means, he can reveal to you the dream. Besides, if I tell you what the dream is, you can make up any kind of lie to tell me. And how will I know if it's true? So you tell me what the dream was, and then I'll know your interpretation is trustworthy. Pretty smart. Puts the wise men in a box. Uh, the wise men's response down in verse 11 of Daniel 2. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult. There is no one else who could declare it to the king except gods, whose dwelling place is not with flesh. Well, then, what good are you to me? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was a brilliant ruler, but he was man short on patience. So his immediate response is to say, all right, you wise men are no good to me. The command goes out, put all the wise men in Babylon to death, that contingent, that group that would have made up uh, those counselors. Word comes to Daniel, who would be among those. And he says to the commander representing Nebuchadnezzar, give me a, few, a little bit of time here. I can uh, give you the answer. So he goes to his friends in verse 17, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who have been deported with him to Babylon. And they go to prayer. What remarkable faith. I mean, for Daniel to tell Nebuchadnezzar's commander, uh, you don't have to put anybody to death. Uh, I can provide the dream and the interpretation to the king. I mean, that's great faith just to start. Then he goes and prays to God. I mean, he's praying to the God of Israel, having seen the northern ten tribes be carried into captivity by the Assyrians. And now the southern kingdom has been defeated by Babylon. And he's in Babylon because he was deported. And he still has faith that God is sovereign and rules over all. And he can give the interpretation. And God responds to Daniel and his friends' prayers. And verse 20, Daniel said... Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belongs to him. It is he who changes the times and epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. He hides, he reveals, he goes on. Uh, testimony to Daniel's faith in God. Uh, the turmoil in Israel... Uh, the crushing defeats for Israel, the difficulty of being deported from his own land, none of that has shaken Daniel's firm faith in God. And now he's reminded God is sovereign over the nations of the earth. He arranges, in verse 21, he changes the times and epics. He removes kings and establishes kings. He's fully confident that Nebuchadnezzar reigns because God's put Nebuchadnezzar there. So he then tells Nebuchadnezzar's commander, uh, representative, take me to Nebuchadnezzar, I can uh, give the answer. Uh, verse 26, the king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, 
His name had been changed like uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah has been changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, and so the king said to him, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? And, you know, this is an awesome uh, setting. I mean, Daniel standing before the king of the earth. He's a man short on patience. He's the man who will have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's three friends, thrown into a fiery furnace because they won't bow down and worship him. This is not a man in whose presence you want to make a mistake. Daniel's response uh, to uh, the king in verse 27, As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, diviners are able to clear it. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. And even tells Nebuchadnezzar what he was thinking before he had the dream. As for you, O king, verse 29, while on your bed your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future. And he who reveals mystery as, as mysteries has made known to you what will take place. What an awesome God. And he's revealed to Daniel. You know, when Nebuchadnezzar went to bed that night, he was laying there thinking, here I am, king of the earth. I wonder what's going to happen in future years. Nebuchadnezzar is aware. Empires have come and gone. Kings have come and gone. I wonder what will take place in the future. And God brought him a dream. Pagan Nebuchadnezzar gets a dream from God. Verse 31. Daniel tells him the dream. You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue was large and of extraordinary splendor. It was standing in front of you and its appearance was awesome. You'll note here how Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan, is given an image of the kingdoms of the world. They are splendid. They are awesome. Keep that in mind. Later Daniel will get the same vision but a different picture. The head of that statue was made of fine gold. And you're going to go down through. It's an image of a man. Splendid and awesome. And as you move down from the head to the feet, there will be a deterioration in the metals. Um, in their quality. But we're going to see there is a building strength. The head was made of fine gold. Its breast and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron, clay, and crushed them. Then the iron, clay, bronze, silver, gold were all crushed at the same time, became like the chaff blown from the threshing floors. The wind carried them away. They're not found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. There's an overview of the kingdoms of the world from the time that Babylon ruled down until the time when Jesus Christ will rule and reign over all the earth. That concise, clear presentation Daniel gives the interpretation. You're familiar with it. Begins by saying, verse 37, You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. Wherever sons of men dwell, or beasts of the field, or herds of the sky, he has given them all into your hand, caused you to rule over them. You're represented in the head of gold. The Babylonian Empire which will be an empire for a short period of time, about 70 years, and it's gone. Uh, it served God's purpose. And you note how Daniel presents it. You are the king of kings. Daniel doesn't belittle his position, but he reminds him, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and glory. 
Verse 38, he has given them into your hand and caused you to rule over them. You're the king of kings, but you are not the sovereign over all. The God who is sovereign over all, who raises up rulers and puts them down, has put you into place. Nebuchadnezzar will have to go through some further trials to really uh, come to understand and believe that. So we have the head of gold. Then you go to the next empire. After you, verse 39, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you. We're deteriorating. We go from gold to silver. And we move from Babylon to the Medo-Persian Empire. And then a third empire. Uh, The middle of verse 39, a third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. That will be Greece. We start with Babylon. We know what the next empire is. Medo-Persia. Persia becomes dominant. We often just refer to it as the Persian Empire. That was followed by the Greeks, the Greek Empire. Then verse 40, there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. So like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. So iron doesn't have uh, the value of gold, but it has the strength like nothing else has had. Now, on the back of your bulletin, if you can't keep these in mind, you write them down. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Those four. Then he goes on in verse 41. In that you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. So we go from the kingdom of iron to a form of that kingdom of iron in the toes. I take it the toes will be ten toes. We're talking about an image of a man. It will be ten as we'll see in a little bit. The feet of Uh, the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, it would be a divided kingdom. It will have in it the toughness of iron inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. The toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery. The kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. In that you saw the iron mixed with the common clay. You see, he's elaborating in greater detail on this fourth empire and the final form of this fourth empire. The iron mixed with common clay, as it was in the feet and toes. Uh, They don't mix with one another. They won't adhere to one another. Verse 44. In the days of those kings, which kings? Well, the final form here, the toes. That will become even more clear as we go along. The days of those kings, the toes of the here are going to represent kings. The final form of the Roman Empire, because the iron continues. But it doesn't have the strength of the original Roman Empire, because it's mixed with clay. And so it's a mixture, it has strength, but it has brittleness. When you come to that stage of the kingdom... In those days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. A kingdom that will not be left for another people. In other words, there will be no kingdom to succeed that kingdom. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. All other earthly kingdoms will be over. And itself will endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. There'll be a kingdom established, not because of military maneuvers and all of that. It crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. This is awesome. God has revealed to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream the entire scope of earthly empires. From the empire that Nebuchadnezzar was ruling down until the final empire that is yet future. Now it's true, as we've talked about prophecy in the Old Testament, events connected with the first coming of Christ to be born at Bethlehem and his subsequent death on the cross and events connected with his second coming to earth, ruling and reigning, are 
put right together. Now, God doesn't say they happen together. He just tells about both events. Remember, we've referred to Peter several times in the New Testament. Peter wrote and said, this was why the Old Testament prophets couldn't sort it all out. Sometimes Isaiah the prophet wrote about the suffering and death of Christ. Sometimes he wrote about the ruling and reigning. In chapter 2, he talks about the Messiah will rule and reign over all the earth and there will be peace. And he repeats that in chapter 9 and repeats it in chapter 11. Chapter 53, he's talking about the Messiah being rejected by his people, put to death. Which is it? And sometimes events aren't in order. In his early chapters, he's talking about ruling and reigning, and then he talks about his death, then he goes back and talks about his reigning, and sometimes, you know, you're going back and forth. So here, events are sometimes put together. Between the uh, part of iron, the lower body, and the legs, in the Roman Empire, you'll remember, will divide into the Eastern and Western Empire. And then the toes of iron and clay, there is a break. This carries uh, up, the Old Testament goes and carries us up to the first coming of Christ. And events around the first coming. Then it talks about events connected with the second coming. The Old Testament does not reveal anything about the period of time in which we live. The church age. Beginning in Acts chapter 2. And then down until uh, the seven year period. That will precede the return of Christ to earth. Uh, they're not considered in the Old Testament. That doesn't change anything that's said in the Old Testament. It's just something that was not revealed. So here we have the different earthly empires. We go from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece to Rome and then do a form of the Roman Empire that will be a Uh, bringing together of ten kings or kingdoms. They don't have the strength of iron, but it'll be brittle because of uh, the mixture of clay in the picture. Come over to Daniel chapter 7. And later now, Nebuchadnezzar has passed off the scene and Belshazzar is the king of Babylon. And he'll have a short time. Um, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. He wrote the dream down. And here's the summary. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night and behold the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four great beasts were coming out from the sea different from one another. Daniel sees it from God's perspective, the empires of the world like ravenous beasts. Nebuchadnezzar saw it as a beautiful, awesome, splendid image of a man with different metals. Here, these are different wild beasts attacking one another. But you note the same, four beasts. How many empires did we have leading up to the empire of the Messiah? Well, we had four basic ones. We're going to have the same four basic ones here. The first one was like a lion in verse 4 in the description of the lion. So paralleling with chapter 2, that would be Babylon. Then verse 5, a second beast, another beast, a second one resembling a bear. It was raised up on one side. That's the Medo-Persian Empire. started out as the combination So it's raised up on one side because the Persians become the dominant force. So sometimes we just refer to it as the Persian Empire. But it's like that. It was the Medo-Persian Empire. This bear raised up on one side, noting noting the dominance. And the three ribs were three key kingdoms that the Medo-Persians devoured. Um, Verse 6. I kept looking and another 
animal. A leopard. That's description. Describing Greece. It's the, the wings of the leopard. Something of the rapidity of Alexander the Great in moving his armies. And then you'll note, uh, the beast had four heads, this leopard. What happened? Alexander the Great is dead in his early 30s. And the Greek Empire is divided among his four key generals. So the details that God chooses to reveal uh, about future events. Then we have verse 7, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. Remember the fourth beast in Daniel chapter 2? Uh, wasn't called a beast there. It was the image of the man made of iron because of its strength greater than any of the other kingdoms. It was dreadful, terrifying, extremely strong. It devoured, crushed, trampled down, crushed the other empires. It had ten horns. Hmm. Well, we had the ten toes. Uh, didn't say ten, but it was the image of a man. So when it talked about the toes, plural, it was talking about normal toes on a man. Here we have the same picture. It had ten horns. Why is contemplating the horns? And the horns represent a king or a kingdom, uh, just like a mountain does in uh, Old Testament prophecy. While I was contemplating the horns, these ten horns, behold, another horn, a little one came up among them. Three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. This horn possessed the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. Now we've got additional information. We not only have the fourth empire, Rome, and a later form of it, ten kings or kingdoms federated together with the strength of iron and the brittleness of clay. Now out of the ten, we have another king or kingdom. These are each part of the Roman Empire. Um, further developments of it. Because you're here, the horns were on the head of the fourth beast. And then this little horn comes out from among the ten. And dominates a third of that alliance and becomes the superpower. Where does that bring us to? I kept looking until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. And you have in this heavenly scene preparing for the coming of of Christ to establish his kingdom. Verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven one like a son of man was coming. He came up to the ancient of days was presented before him. To him was giving dominion, glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. You see, I have the same overview. Nothing is changed in the first one from Daniel chapter 2, but some additional information is filled in to give fuller and clearer understanding. Daniel is distressed, verse 15. Uh, sees all this, and what can all this mean? So he approaches one of the angels standing by. And I say, could you uh, explain this to me? And so... He told me, made known to me the interpretation. Verse 17, these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings which will arise from the earth. And a king and a kingdom are identified together. Uh, so four kings or kingdoms that will arise from the earth. We start with Daniel's day. We have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. So there are only four uh, major kingdoms here. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Well, that's pretty much a summary. You're going to have four major kingdoms. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Then Christ is going to come, wipe all earthly kingdoms out, and he will rule over all the earth. What else do you need to know? Verse 19. 
Daniel said, I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast. This is what, uh, you know, uh, enthralls him. Uh, What about this fourth beast? Because there's a development of this fourth beast. I mean, he's the most powerful. Then you're going to have ten horns, ten kings, and then another little horn. Could you explain that? I want to know about the fourth beast, exceeding dreadful and terrible, teeth of iron, claws of bronze, crushed, trampled down the remainder, and the meaning of the ten horns which were on his head, and then the other one which came up, before which the three of them fell. That horn that had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, which was larger in appearance than its associate. And I kept looking, that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. So now Daniel fills in. He had given a summary, but now as he asks for interpretation, we get more details on what that dream entailed because he wants that to explain to him. And that final little horn that was greater and more powerful than the alliance of the ten, he reigned until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. So you see, that's where that will carry us. Now you tell there is a a gap in here because we're not in the kingdom. All these kingdoms that we've been talking about are earthly kingdoms ruling over the earth. Jesus Christ is not on earth ruling over the earth. The people of God have not taken possession of the kingdom. All kingdoms of the earth have not been crushed under the authority of Christ. Have you turned on the news lately? And people say, we're in the kingdom. I'm grappling for a word other than idiot. Uh, and I realize that's not nice. Morons. It's the word God uses. I mean, it's stupid. What do you mean? Who gives us the authority to say, well, Babylon, was that a spiritual kingdom or an earthly kingdom? Well, read history. Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. But the kingdom of Christ, that's a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men. I don't believe it. Daniel didn't believe it. The angel from heaven didn't believe it. Here's the explanation. Verse 23, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, different from all the other kingdoms, and that's the most powerful and dominant. That's true of Rome. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom. So that's why we talk about the continuation of the revival of the Roman Empire. Out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise. So we know the horns represented ten kings, or kingdoms, like The toes in chapter 2. Another king or kingdom will arise after them. He will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High, wear down the saints of the highest one, intend to make alterations in times and law. They will be given into his hand for a time, two times, and a half time. Two and a half times. Expression used uh, several, two or three times in Daniel. It refers to three and a half years. It'll be developed more fully as uh, we get later, particularly in the book of Revelation. So here now we've got real details. Because this final uh, development of the fourth empire, Rome, going to center in a man who's going to have his attention on destroying the saints. Frustrating God's plan. And, note here, even the saints will be given into God's, uh, into this man's power for a time, two times and a half time. Particular focus is the nation Israel. The people that God has chosen for himself. That's why when we put the map up, that little country that doesn't amount to anything. It's not like the world's oil reserves are in Israel. Um, 
What does it have? The joke of Golda Meir told when she was prime minister in Israel about her problem with Moses. He led him for 40 years in the wilderness and ended up with a place that didn't have any oil. Didn't have, what's it got? I mean, and yet, it's, here's what it is. These are God's people. He has chosen the nation Israel. He has promised that his plan for them will culminate with them being back in the physical land of Israel and Jerusalem being capital of the world. In order to uh, bring changes to God's plan and frustrate its fulfillment, he has to destroy the Jews. That's why he can't get away from the Jews. Who cares about that little piece of land? You might think, well, Washington will be the capital of the world. Paris will be the capital of the world. I mean, some great place. Israel? I mean, the world views Israel just as a lot of trouble. They'd only go away. If they don't give up more of their land. Um, no end to it. Here's the answer. Uh, you have a war being waged in the spiritual realm. Satan, trying to frustrate the plan of God. But they're given into his time for two times and a half time. But the court will sit for judgment. His dominion will be taken away, annihilated, destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, dominion, and greatness of all kingdoms under the whole earth will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting king, kingdom, and the dominion will, all dominions will serve and obey him. All Nations will now live under the authority of Christ and his people. Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. The Jews will be the central people on the earth. Um, what details God gives? Right up until we're three and a half years. This final time that will be brought to a conclusion, all the empires, we go from Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, a ten-nation confederacy, one man coming to rule for three and a half years. Then we get Christ come to bring an end to it. So now we know something of the timing that end. We come to the book of Revelation. You know, some people have problems with the book of Revelation. And uh, it is a fascinating book. We're going to Revelation 17. It's perhaps the most unoriginal book in the Bible. We've studied it. We know that there are over 500 references and allusions to the Old Testament. We interpret the book of Revelation the same way we're interpreting the book of Daniel. In a normal way. There are figures of speech, but those figures of speech are conveying a literal and understandable truth, fact. So you come to Revelation chapter 17, and just to fill you in, we're not going here, but the book of Revelation puts all the prophecies that have been given about future events and the end times into sequence. The Old Testament prophesied many of these things, like I said, over 500 references in the book of Revelation, allusions to Old Testament, no direct quotes. Revelation chapter 6 to 19 unfold the details of that seven year period that will climax with the return of Christ to earth. So now you have things being unfolded in detail. Things that were prophesied in pieces in the Old Testament at different times and different places. Now God unfolds that final seven year period we call the 70th week of Daniel. It was a key part of the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 which we did not look at. That final seven-year period divided into two three-and-a-half-year segments, and we've already seen in Daniel 7, what? The last three-and-a-half years will be dominated by that one who is called the little horn, a king who will try to annihilate Israel. 
So when we come to chapter 17, we've come through chapters uh, 6 and following, unfolding the details. We are coming now to the end ready for the return of Christ. So we're getting near that last three and a half year period. Um, Verse 3. He carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names having seven heads and ten horns. Well, seven heads and ten horns. Well, a head, as we're going to see, refers to a kingdom like a mountain refers to a kingdom or a horn refers to a kingdom in prophecy. Seven heads. How does this connect to Daniel? Well, Daniel started where he was. The revelation to him. In other words, Babylon was ruling the world. They were the nation. The Bible's only concerned about the nations that impact Israel. Babylon. And he went from there. John takes us back before Babylon to the two preceding nations that are important to Israel. What preceded Babylon? Assyria. What preceded Assyria? Egypt. Of course, Egypt is important in Israel's history. Israel spent 400 years in Egypt. Then Assyria, of course. They conquered the northern ten tribes and carried them away into captivity in 722 B.C. So John goes back to the beginning. So now he has Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the ten nations, ten kings, that's seven, use your fingers. The beast represented here is going to be the final form, that little horn we saw. He's the culmination of all these others. The final form of world empire under the authority of the God of this world, Satan, in his attempt to frustrate the plan of God. So you see, we say, well, what could this mean? Well, we come down, uh, verse 7, and uh, the angel said to me, the woman on the beast uh, refers to the religious element, the apostate church that will work together in that final seven-year period. And ultimately be destroyed in the middle of that seven year period when the Antichrist requires that he be worshipped as God. But we won't go into that now. Verse 7, the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast has this because he is the culmination of earthly empires. Uh, And uh, the ones we've looked at. The beast that you saw was and is not is about to come out of the abyss and go to destruction. Those who dwell on the earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life and the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. And we haven't taken the time to go back to chapter 13. But if you went back there, you would find that this one has a wound to death, but he is revived. And that evidently will contribute to his being accepted as a divine person, uh, as God in the flesh. Uh, You have some of the similar uh, pictures, the seven heads and ten horns back in chapter 13. But stay with chapter 17. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, they are seven kings. So the connection here, seven heads are seven mountains are seven kings. I wrote a thesis on this page, part of Revelation, many years ago. Um, They all refer to the same thing. The seven heads are seven mountains are seven kings. So understand, well, I wonder what these mountains, I wonder what these heads represent. Well, the seven heads are seven mountains. You know anything about Old Testament prophecy? Mountain referred to a kingdom. And if you don't, there are seven kings. A king and a kingdom used interchangeably. Um, you know, we use it the same today. What will the United States do? Or some people would say, I wonder what the president will do. Because he acts representing the country, so he gets identified. We refer that way to the king or the leader 
and uh, his nation. So here, there are seven kings. Now let's follow this. Five have fallen. The five kingdoms have fallen. All right, John's taking us back to the beginning with Egypt, remember? Egypt, one. Assyria, two. Babylon, three. Persia, four. Greece, five. Five have fallen. Those nations were history, as John writes. One is, number six, Rome. The other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. That would be the ten nation confederacy. The ten toes, the ten horns. Ten kings or kingdoms. That will form the seventh here. And the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth. That's the little horn we saw in Daniel chapter 7. He's one of the seven. Remember what happened in Daniel chapter 7? He displaced three of the kings or kingdoms, becomes the dominant overpowering figure. And in that sense, he's different enough to be considered an eighth empire, but still part of the Roman Empire as the ten nation confederacy was. As the iron continued, they're on the head of that uh, fourth beast in Daniel chapter uh, 7. He's one of the seven, he's an eighth, he goes to destruction. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not received a kingdom yet. So you see, these ten kings or king, uh, over our nations or kingdoms will join together to form one kingdom. These ten horns are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom. But they'll be federated together. But since you put these ten together, they are uh, brittle as well as strong. Um, I was reading... Uh, article on the European Union. They were talking about its power supersedes the United States. And uh, they were noting the different ways. But there's a brittleness there. Because you have the individual nations looking out for themselves, assuming that perhaps the European Union will uh, finally come together. Uh, perhaps as this uh, ten-nation confederacy uh, the ten horns are ten kings. They haven't yet received a kingdom. So from John's perspective, they're future. He didn't know how future. They are still future. We know that for sure. No doubt. Some try to find a fulfillment of the ten kings or kingdoms in the past. Um, later Roman emperors or something. They receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. So they are inseparably connected to this little horn. This eight that comes out of the ten. Uh, the seventh empire. Well, how do you know he wasn't past who? Well, these ten have their one purpose. Verse 13. They give their power and authority to the beast. They have come in in the plan of God and under the uh, determination of Satan... Because he's trying to create an alternative to the kingdom over which the Messiah will rule. Remember, Satan desires to replace God. I know it makes no sense. But his original fall came with, I will be like him. I will, I will. And so he knows enough to know God's plan. He knows enough to know that the Jews are central to the kingdom that God will establish on the earth. If he can annihilate the Jews, God can't fulfill his promises and establish the promised kingdom. And the Jewish Messiah can't rule over a Jewish-centered earth. Satan wins. Sin makes you stupid. I mean, can Satan win? Satan is a brilliant creature. I say with respect that sin makes you stupid, but it dulls your ability to really believe what is clear truth. Satan has read the closing chapters of Revelation. He loses. 
But sin somehow makes people think they can win against God. There are people who don't believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, have never bowed before Him realizing the wretchedness of their sinful condition, and that they deserve an eternal hell even though God has clearly said it. Why would you be so foolish? You can't win. You either bow in submission to God or you are sentenced by that God to an eternal hell. But here it is, all laid out. There it's verse 14. These, they'll join together with this final uh, world ruler, the little horn, the Antichrist. They will wage war against the Lamb. The Lamb will overcome them because He's Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with Him are the called and chosen. He said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot. This apostate religious system. Uh, The Antichrist has no use for it once he has solidified his power. Because he will require all to worship him. Revelation 13 has uh, given us insight on that. So he destroys her. Verse 17, for God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose, by giving their kingdom to the beast until the word of God will be fulfilled. So these ten kings, why would they want to give up? Because God has put it in their heart to fulfill their rebellious desires. And now they have the one that they can worship and follow. Uh, This little horn, the beast, the Antichrist. Well, where are we? Well, we finish with destruction here of religious and commercial Babylon in 17 and 18. And you open up chapter 19. There's celebration in heaven. Why? Because now is time. The time for Christ to descend from heaven, destroy his enemies, and establish his kingdom on earth. Verse 11 of chapter 19, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. He who sat on it is called faithful and true. In righteousness he judges and wages war. Verse 14, the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword and he destroys his enemies. Verse 19, I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and his army and they are all destroyed and then you see chapter 20 verse 4 I saw the thrones and they sat on them judgment was given to them I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony because of the word of God those who had not worshipped the beast or his image not received the mark they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years after a thousand years there's fine, one final act of rebellion Then we move into the eternal phase of the kingdom. So chapter 21 you have opens up, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Down in verse 10, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Jerusalem. And now we are going to move into eternity where God will dwell on the new earth with Jerusalem as the capital. Gloriously described here. This is how uh, it all ends. Or could I say all begins? Because now we moved out to where billions and trillions and there is no end. And you just get a sampling of here. So what do we have unfolded? What Christ came at his first coming to accomplish and make possible will ultimately be realized at his second coming. That's why we are not disturbed, not shaken in our faith, not unsettled by the turmoil and confusion of the world. Jesus said, in the world you have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. There will be slaughter and death on a scale never seen or experienced in the history of the world. 
in those seven years leading up to the return of Christ. Billions of people will die on the face of the earth. Literally. The book of Revelation unfolds. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 24, if he didn't intervene and cut this off after seven years, there wouldn't be a survivor on the face of the earth. He said no one would survive if he didn't intervene after seven years. But he intervenes to rescue his people, particularly the nation Israel, and bring to fulfillment all that he promised. You're in the book of Revelation. Come over to chapter 22. This terrific book about the future concludes with some exhortation. Verse 10, he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. That's how God sees it. What's unfolded here is on the near horizon. How near? Today, tomorrow, it's coming. There are some events that will intervene. We're at least seven years away from the kingdom he will establish. We'll talk a little bit more about that in our next study. Verse 12, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so they may have the right to the tree of life, and men may enter into the gates of the city. Outside of the dogs, the sorcerers, immoral persons, murderers, idolaters, everyone who loves and practices lying, everyone who has not partaken of the benefits of the provision of salvation in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ will be excluded from the city that has been described as the dwelling place of God and his people in eternity. The only other place in eternity is hell. It was described for us in Revelation chapter 14 and again at the end of Revelation chapter 20 where everyone whose name is not found in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire and the smoke of their torment will go up into the ages of the ages. That's terrible. It's awful. More awful than you and I can imagine. That's why a merciful and loving God has provided salvation. Through the death of his son. What do you think Christ came to earth for? This is serious. Our condition is hopeless. Apart from the salvation God provided. Look what Jesus says in verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David. The one who would fulfill the promises to David in 2 Samuel 7 a descendant of David to rule over the earth forever. The bright and morning star, now look, the spirit and the bride say come. Let the one who hears say come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let everyone who wishes to take the water of life without cost. How gracious is the invitation. There is salvation. There is forgiveness. There is life. Why will you perish? Why would you say no? The closing book of the Bible, God's closing revelation, after unfolding all that will happen and warning of the wrath of God on those who continue to reject his salvation, Jesus closes and say, come. That's the message that continues to go. Come. Come. You can partake of the water of life. It's free. Same thing Isaiah said in Isaiah 55. Come. You don't have any money. You don't have the money. Come. Oh, I could never earn that. No, you couldn't. It's free. Come. Same thing Jesus said during the earth. Come unto me, all you who are laboring and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Then a word of warning. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. Anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are in this book. If anyone takes away from them, God will take away his part from the tree of life and the holy city which were written. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. How gracious God is. Um, We still have time. 
there's still time for this invitation to go out. Every one of us, verse 17 says, the spirit and the bride say, come. The bride is the church. Come, let the one who hears say, come. Everyone who hears and responds to this now tells others to come. And anyone who is thirsty, come. Uh, no restrictions, no limitations. You can't bring anything with you. Not your good works, not your church activity, not your baptism, not your confirmation. You just have to come as you are. Lord, I have nothing to bring. I have nothing to contribute. I am a defiled, hell-deserving sinner. You are an awesome, holy God. I come claiming mercy. How simple. Mercy. I'm going to claim what I don't deserve. But what you've provided for me. That's what happens when we recognize our sinful condition. Recognize that God has sent his son to be the savior so that those who respond to him can enjoy the blessings of the eternity that he has promised to those who belong to him. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for the riches of your word. Thank you, Lord, for the details that you have unfolded about future things. Lord, we are not discouraged. We are not disappointed. We are not frustrated about the confusion and misery, wretchedness of this world. We're saddened to see so many reject your grace and the gift of life in Christ. But Lord, that would not deter us from encouraging them to come to Christ, from telling them of the wonderful provision that you have made. Lord, by your grace, we would ask to be instruments you use to direct others to the Savior that we love. May we serve day by day in honoring you in anticipation of the glory that will be the fulfillment of all you've promised. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.